But you know, at 80 something thousand records now, I'm glad we did that. But we had the resources in our institution with uh, student labor and, and uh, uh, interns and stuff that we could get a lot of that done. So it worked for us okay. A lot of people don't choose that. They choose a more skeletal record to try to get lots of quantity done with the intent to go back and plug in the robust data as needed for specific projects or specific uh, distant groups, depending on what the researchers want, the scientists in the institution want. So you've got you've to gotta think about that. High cost per specimen versus low cost per specimen. NSF wants it to be low, and I think we have frankly sold NSF a bill of goods. We've made them think that we can do this cheap. Why? Because if we say we can do it cheap, they'll fund us. But then if we can't do it cheap, you know, we're sort of leading NSF to think if somebody turns in the truth about what it's going to cost them to digitize a collection per specimen, then we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot later. So somehow we have to educate NSF about the true cost of doing this digitization. We've got to factor in that time it takes to go from the from the imaging station to the to the cab cabinet. We've got to factor in the time that, that all that stuff. If we don't factor it in, we're not giving a true cost of what it costs to image something. I mean, you can take a picture in a hurry, right? But there's a lot of work that goes on around that imaging that costs money. Um, and so that's important. Um, uh, let's see. Ancillary materials versus specimens only. In a perfect world, I could go to a specimen. And on that specimen, I could click buttons and I could go to all the related monographs and papers that that specimen is related to. I could go to white papers, I could go to field notes, I could go to all that stuff if I could. That is the eventual goal, but you have to decide up front what is your goal? Is that where you want to start? And there are people that say, I would just rather start with field notes because I can get all these field notes digitized uh, much more rapidly and they all relate to the specimens in my collection. And so I'll have a lot of good data digitized, and then I can go back and start adding images or populating records. Again, it's up to the institution to make those decisions. You just have to um, uh, think through it. Evolving workflows and static workflows. You know, I'm a writer, and I, I, uh, I love to finish writing. I don't like writing very much, but I love to finish. I don't ever want to go back and look at it again. Um, that's a bad plan for workflows, because things change. So you have to build into your workflow some evolving methodology where you are picking up from your technicians what they are doing and what they are finding that doesn't work. Um, we went through that with one herbarium that I worked with, um, and it was, you know, we had this really great plan on paper. It looked good, it looked good. Just didn't match anybody's personality, nobody's needs. Took forever to make it work, although it looked like it would have been very, very, and finally the guy in charge said, can you just do it that way once? So that we, we quit doing it immediately because it didn't work. And so we tried it and it didn't work. So the bottom line is you've got to take information back from your technicians. You've got to be on hand. I was at a, uh, an institution just a few months ago. I won't say who. I'm a little represented here. But, um, <laughs> and, and, and the person that was in charge, the curator, we walked into an imaging room and the person was showing me how uh, what the great stuff they were doing. And then uh, the curator began to Converse with the imager and explain to the imager some things that she was doing wrong and this person had been working on this for like a year and we walked out and he was shaking his head and said, I just don't understand why she's doing that. I said, you haven't told her not to. And he said, well, but I mean, she shouldn't. I said, no, 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 no. You shouldn't figure it out. You've got to be in there with your technicians and you've got to see what they're doing and say, you know what, That's a, there's a better way for you to do this. It'll make it easier on you, faster, better on the collection, whatever. So you've got to constantly take feedback back from your workflows and make them better. Oh, the other thing is, do we image everything? Do we image nothing? Or do we do something in between where we select <coughs> exemplars from our collections? Most of you guys are probably in the position of selecting exemplars uh, out, of, uh, out of your collections. And that's, that's a great way to go. But those are the decisions fundamentally you have to make up front. Robust versus Spartan data. Again, fitness to use. Um, are you recording the annotations? Are you specializing your staff? Um, are you emphasizing images or emphasizing data? All of these are um, decision points that have to be made. Now, last year, Deb Cole and I visited around the eastern United States, uh, a number of institutions looking at what were the effective digitization practices that they used. And we published that in the Zoki's digitization edition that came out last July. We had a really good time doing that. We intended to visit a lot more institutions. And then this publication happened. And we had the opportunity to get this out in a publication that would probably be read in. And so we decided.
decided to do that. And what we discovered in our um, in our uh, adventure was essentially the context of this workshop. Uh, there were about five major task clusters that people accomplished to digitize their collections. And pre-digitization curation, or staging, some people call it, is very, very important. Uh, collector, collection managers love that phase, right? Because you love working in the collection. You've got all these other things impinging on you. That you don't get to do the stuff you really love. And now you've got to get it ready to be digitized, which means now you can do the stuff you really love because you're supposed to do it. And, and you've got a reason. So the pre-digitization curation, which to me seemed like it was going to be as a compulsive kind of a person, impulsive, compulsive, fast-moving person, I thought that seems like that's going to take a lot of time to finally get around and get some pictures and data. And, uh, but that's not the way collection managers look at it, and I have to admit it, it's kind of fun. So the bottom line is that turned out to be a very important phase, and it's essential to get a collection ready for digitization, whether it's done some people do the whole collection and then start. Some people do bits and pieces and, and, and fold it in together. Um, data capture is another cluster. Image capture is another cluster. Image processing is another cluster. Geo referencing is another cluster. And in most of these institutions, that cluster was sort of outside of the main digitization workflow. It was something that you came back and did at another point. That's changing to some degree. And else we'll probably talk about that a little bit tomorrow. Um, so that's changing somewhat, and this, uh, um, this geo-referencing is becoming more integrated. Ed will talk about that too as part of somebody else, uh, and Andy will talk about it as part of Specify. It's becoming more integrated, and if it does, then I think um, it could end up being more inserted directly into the workflow as, and, and, it, and not being sort of a data enrichment activity after the workflow is over. Um, we also found out that personnel is very important. And in most cases in this room, personnel means taking who you get uh, from student workers and uh, federal work study students and scholarship students and interns and whoever that have to do some time. Uh, you know, they do the time with you. And, and then you have to use those folks. So learning ways to select them in a way that helps make your digitization is extremely, uh, extremely important. And it can be done. I've seen it done in a lot of institutions. Just means you have to think of it. And we'll talk about that some later today. Um, and then written protocols. I cannot tell you how important written protocols are. And I don't mean written protocols like the ones I write, which are just one text line after another. I mean, put pictures and arrows and circles and stuff in there. Point to the button you're supposed to click. Won't click if you don't point to that. And, and put everything in the protocol. I'm talking to Brian, and he said, Brian's philosophy, and he said he had a student that did everything right. The thing he forgot to tell them how to do was fire. And so they went back to the cabinets and they just put the jars anywhere. So that's not a good plan, right? So, so you've got to be sure you include everything in your protocol because those steps, they don't know what you're doing. Many of these students are just doing what they're telling them. So you've got to really build everything in your protocol and put pictures in there. Okay. Um, then the other thing that most institutions are not blessed with um, is a biodiversity informatics manager. Uh, those folks are sort of the glue that really provides service to the collections managers, helping them uh, do, do their workflow designs, moving their data around, helping them do what they need to do to be discussed. This is more likely to happen in the larger institutions, but somehow we have to figure out at all institutional levels a, ma a way to get biodiversity informatics management as a fundamental role even if it's a part-time role by somebody who does something else. Many institutions, many biology departments have a, an IT person or a couple of people that deal with your computer technology, some on programs, <coughs> write applications for the department. Those kind of folks have to be wrapped in and turned on to biological collection digitization. And we've got to teach them to fill that role of biodiversity informatics management. They can take your data and do things with it that you might not be able to do. I mean, Sounds very simple to send something to GBIP or to send something to IDBio, but then when it goes to mapping those data out of your database and getting them in the right format and getting them exported to somebody in a way um, that, that then that institution can take that data and use it on, uh, in their database so that your data becomes exposed, um, it's more challenging you've got to take. Deb Paul, who is our user services person at IDBio, can work with you heavily on that. They've got a lot of experience with Mortifying. I can tell you, I was one of those people uh, with Warp Bank, 
who really didn't want to do all that formatting. So I'll just put all this data together, put it into a spreadsheet, make it look kind of good, send it to Deb. And Deb, bless her heart, would most of the time fix it. She would send back and tell me what I had done wrong, but I knew if I waited two days, Deb couldn't stand it, and she would fix it. <laughs> <laughs> it only took me one time to figure that out. I worked my funds off all day long. I got it done. I sent it back then. She said, it's already uploaded. I said, mine? She said, that's what I did. So I thought, well, there's the lesson you don't want to forget. So the next time, I just sent all the data, and she got it. It worked great. You had a comment?